Hey, I'm Don Blackwell. This is Aaron Gallagher. Welcome back to Answering the Error. We are reviewing a video by an organization called Cultish in which they have asserted that the Church of Christ is a cult. It's a two hour long video and so we've broken it into parts. This is part number five. Let's begin. So you're now, you're getting, you're, now, Andrew, you're getting into another doctrine of okay. the Church of Christ. Well, the Church of Christ doesn't really have doctrines like written down that you study. We don't, there's no confessions and you know none of that. Yeah. But this is the, the teachings, right? And the teaching is the Old Testament doesn't apply to you. Now, that's a big deal. You just got rid of 90% of God's revelation to you, okay? Show them what the Bible so, looks like when you take out yeah. the Old Testament and so, the Gospels. Here's uh, what you're doing here is you're saying this right here. Well, let me get right. It's New Testament. It, well, real quick, while, while you're pulling that up, you're I just, go ahead. Go ahead. Just while, while you're pulling that up, uh, I just want to jump in too. And by the way, it, we are live right now. So if you are watching us on, we're just streaming here on Facebook. So if you have any questions too, and maybe we'll do a, a Q&A interaction uh, tomorrow, but you know, just definitely give, give any commentary or thoughts that you have on this episode as we're streaming it live here. And we've actually got some, and so while we're talking about baptism, we're talking about the context of Bad theology hurts people, and uh, one of these, uh, Karen uh, Richter Hill, left this message, uh, left this comment here, and said, uh, "I said I had a Church of Christ friend tell me that if you found someone dying in the street, you cannot give them the gospel mm -hmm. to go to heaven. Right. You have to take them to the Church of Christ and have them baptized to go to heaven." Right. So again, that that shows one mm -hmm. a, a lack of disregard for those who are you know in that position right. on the street, but then the, there's this unweighted burden that oh no. I want this person to hear the gospel, but I can't do anything because yeah, I don't have the ability to take him up, to pull him off the streets right. uh, and do that. Right. So, mm. Sad. yeah. And so back to what you're saying is uh, in John three, you're quoting verse 15, right? That when he's lifted up and whoever believes in him, uh, he doesn't say be baptized, but their explanation is that, well, the old Testament doesn't apply to you, right? So this right here of revelation of God, this much doesn't apply only this much, right? Well, that's ridiculous. So in this section, Trey begins to talk about how, allegedly, the churches of Christ teach and believe that the Old Testament doesn't apply to you. Um, he says you just got rid of about 90% of Revelation. Depending on how you do it, it's between 60 and 75 or so, not 90. But um, do we teach that the Old Testament does not apply to us? Absolutely, we do not teach that. That's an accusation I've heard many times, but mm -hmm. um, we don't say that. Uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says the things that were written aforetime, that's talking about the Old Testament, were written for our learning. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11 says, now all these things, talking about these examples from the Old Testament, mm -hmm. happened to them <clears throat> as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. Mm -hmm. You can't really understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. If you read the book of Hebrews, it is immersed in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The book of Revelation is immersed in the Old Testament. Part of why people don't understand the New Testament, in, uh, particularly the book of Revelation, is because they don't understand the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. There are 283 direct quotations from the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you take quotations and allusions and references to the Old Testament, and the New Testament, there are over a thousand of them. And so to say that we don't believe the Old Testament is not true. We teach and preach. We learn from their examples. We learn about the nature of God. We learn uh, proofs for the existence mm -hmm. of God. Um, tremendous lessons and things we believe and teach from the Old Testament. What we don't believe is that we live under the law of Moses mm -hmm. or the Old Testament law. Mm -hmm because uh, Colossians 2.14 says that that law was nailed to the cross. Mm -hmm. And so today we live under the law of Christ. The law mm -hmm. that is applicable to us today mm -hmm. is the New Testament law. So they're really skewing this and misrepresenting it. Yeah, in Romans 7 verse 4, it basically says that if you want to be married to Christ, you have to be dead to the law. That's right. It basically says if you're trying to be married to the law of Moses and to Christ, the Christian age, you're an adulterer That's or right. adulteress. So it says you have to be dead to the law. Which law? Verse 7, the law that said thou shalt not covet. That's right. one of the Ten Commandments. That's right. So 
We definitely study. I just got done teaching the book of Daniel mm-hmm. at South Haven a while back. Mm-hmm. We're learning from the Old Testament, learning about the prophecies, mm-hmm. but we don't teach you have to obey those things under the law of Moses. Uh, I, I know that Trey doesn't offer burnt offerings. Right. So I know he doesn't follow the law of Moses. Right. In fact, I remember in one of our conversations, I talked about how the law of Moses had been done away with. And he said, no, it hasn't. And I said, Trey, don't tell me you keep the Sabbath. I said, do you keep the Sabbath? He said, well, no. I said, then you don't keep the law of Moses either. And I guarantee you, you don't follow Exodus 35 too and put to death anybody who violates the Sabbath. That's right. Just like Seventh-day Adventists don't do that. I've never met a Seventh-day Adventist. I think I'd see it on the news. Church puts to death person for breaking the Sabbath. They don't, mm-hmm. they don't do that. Right. So they don't follow the law of Moses. So they teach the same thing that we do right. about the Old Testament, which is, well, at least some of them do, yeah. that the Old Testament is no longer in force. We are not under the patriarchal covenant. I don't sacrifice animals for my family. Right. We're not under the law of Moses. There's not a priesthood that sacrifices animals. Mm-hmm. We are under the Christian, the new covenant. Right. And, and it's interesting. I've also never heard this about someone from someone who is a member of the church, only from those who are not members of the church speaking against us. Right. So I highly doubt that Trey was ever taught that by anybody that was a member of the church. Right. And if even if he was, we'd say that's wrong. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Next clip. Right. And so here's something, but you, you, you might be thinking, Andrew, you're like, Trey, but John is New Testament. But no, see, what you don't understand is the New Testament doesn't actually start until Acts. Mm. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are actually Old Testament books because that's when Jesus came to fulfill the... He this was is still where, alive. Right. It's a and, gospel, you know, and when yeah. I, you know, I'm talking to some people. I mean, I talked to an elder who I love to death. Um, not too long ago, I said, look, do you think you could be a Christian and say that the words of Christ don't apply to me? Yeah. Like, can you be a Christian and say that? And he's like, no, no, no you can't. I'm like, okay, do you believe John 3.16? He's like, well, yeah. I'm like, okay, let, let's read it slowly. For God so loved the world that, what does he say? Mm-hmm. He gave he his, gives his only begotten, begotten son, son that whoever believes on him. That whoever, so yep. I, do you believe that? Do you really believe that whoever believes in Christ will have eternal life? And he looked at me, he's like, huh, so you don't believe that? Mm. You don't believe the words of Christ? Like, that's, that should be a, what? Like, what kind of, Word judo Bible junk has been happening to me where I don't believe the words of Christ apply to me. Hmm. Right? Right. Because that's in John, not necessarily. Yeah, because that's Old Testament. Either, right. You know? Okay. And so, but you know, it's it's so sad. Yeah. It's just it's heartbreaking. And it really it's it's just heartbreaking. That's all I can tell you, man. I, it yeah, it kills me. So in this section, Trey basically he once again makes the argument that we teach Matthew through John or Old Testament. We don't teach that or believe that. At least Maybe some Church of Christ does out there, but all, Churches of Christ are autonomous. But no one I know has ever taught that. Yeah. And then he says that he talked to an elder and used John 3.16. And he's basically trying to say that we believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John Old Testament. We've said that we don't believe they're Old Testament. And I would also r- remind people, remember the Gospels were written by inspired men when? After the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. So these books that are written, if Mark is the earliest Gospel, some people say 50 to 60 AD, that's 30 years after the crucifixion. If you look in John chapter 14, it's telling you about the events before the crucifixion. And he says that basically the Holy Spirit was going to bring all those things to their remembrance Mm -hmm. and was going to inspire men through the Holy Spirit so they could write these things down. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference between what Jesus was teaching about the church and Christianity and the coming covenant. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes, I know there are guys out there that think John 3, 3 through 5 is talking about Christian baptism. Even if that was the case, Mm -hmm. think about this. What you'd have is a parallel of Jesus speaking about something that was coming into effect. Sure. You have a transition period to those people. I would say that's the same thing as Matthew 16, 18. Yeah. The church is coming in the future. It's going to come in Acts 2. And yet in Matthew 18, what does he teach about? Church discipline. Yeah, we so just so talked about that. yeah. So whichever way you go, it's it's fine either way. But I think it's they say the words of Jesus don't apply. Well, think about this. In Mark one forty four, Jesus healed a leper, and he told him to what? Go show yourself to the priest, priest, and offer your cleansing according to the law of Moses. These guys don't do that. So everything you look at, has you have to examine it in the context. Yeah. Is this something Jesus is speaking about referring to the Sabbath or the law of Moses or something that's been done away with? Or is this something that you see in the church age? And a lot of times you'll see Matthew 18 basically restated in 1 Corinthians 5. Yeah. So a lot of this is just contextual things that they're sort of twisting. Yeah, I think some things are being twisted like um, I have never heard a member of the church say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are part of the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Everyone I know counts it as mm-hmm. part of the New Testament. But the fact of the matter is, 
the record of the people that were living during mm -hmm. that time period, they lived during the Old Testament. That's right. And that's why you see them keeping the Old Testament feast and engaging in animal sacrifices. And that's why Jesus kept the law of Moses his entire life, because he lived during the Old Testament law. Because again, mm -hmm. Hebrews 9, 16 and 17 teaches the New Testament could not go into effect until his death. In fact, if we took Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John out and said that's Old Testament, we've gotten rid of Matthew 28 and the Great Commission. That's right. We've gone to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Mark 16, Luke 24, Mark and John 20 and 21. That's right. Exactly right. Yeah. Next clip. Yeah, and just I'll give another example. One of my thoughts when it comes to de dealing with it, just context-wise, and you know, and especially when you're taught to read a passage out of isolation, you know, you look at John 3 and John 4, just in comparison to each other, and you could use the example of them in the covenant, is that you, like John's using the gospel to show that it's for everyone. You give the example of being Nicodemus, this Pharisee of Pharisees, who was supposed to be very knowledgeable of the Old Testament, and Christ meets him where he is at. And Nicodemus, another thing too, is that Nicodemus is meeting with him at night. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's because he didn't want to be seen uh, right. talking to Jesus. So there's the fear of man aspect there. And later on, you see Nicodemus, he makes a cameo uh, later on in the Gospels. And uh, those of you who know it, you know it, and if not, read it. <laughs> but what's interesting too, is that the very next chapter, you have John chapter four, talking about how the, you know, John three is saying that the Gospels for the Jews and that John four, the Gospels for the Gentiles. So you look at the woman at the well so back during the historical times, the Samaritans were almost viewed as non-human, that right. they were just deal, they were dealt with, yeah, half-breeds, the lesser of the less people. So it's not just a Samaritan. Jesus talks to a Samaritan prostitute and basically calls her out on her sin and meets her, meets her where she's at. It's, just, it's a beautiful passage, but what, where I'm talking about in regards to baptism is that Jesus, Jesus is talking about a metaphor here. In John 3, and church, the Church of Christ would agree with that, right? That he's talking about water, but he's actually talking about baptism. Uh, That's yeah, they the would argument. Say it's baptism. Okay, so I'm, and I've talked about this with someone who's UPC, and he could not answer me for the life of me. Well, here's a situation, and I would say, and here's what I would talk to you as a Church of Christ person, because okay. you have the same view. I would say, well, John, John 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. There's physical water involved, and she asks, how can I have this living water? Mm -hmm. Why is it when she asked that question, not once did Jesus ever mention anything mm -hmm. remotely regarding to baptism? The only thing that came up in the conversation was he called her out on her sin, mm -hmm. and then they had a conversation about the temple, right. and he pointed it to himself. Right. And so that's something where I would just, I would have, and Multimar would do this, where you'd have someone, a cultist, read that text in, in context and then ask the question. Yeah. So if I ask that question to someone at the Church of Christ, yeah. like what, what, what will be your process as someone in the Church of Christ like if see, I brought that up to you? So, I'm so in this section, Jeremiah makes a few comments about how cultists, cultists don't read the context and they consistently pull passages out. Hopefully if you've been through five episodes with us now, we'd, I'd like to think you'd have seen that we actually do look at the text and the context and try to explain the things. Yeah. Then he makes a statement that the gospel was going to the Jews in John 3 and the Samaritans in John 4, and yet doesn't mention baptism. Well, we've already discussed, he does mention it in John chapter 3 mm -hmm. to a Jewish person. Why do you think he wouldn't mention baptism in John chapter 4 to the Samaritan woman? You know, it, it's interesting. He brings this up and uh, seems to think there's a great strong point here. Mm -hmm. Why would he not have mentioned baptism to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 when he just mentioned it to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? I think it has to do with the fact that Christ's baptism is not in effect yet. Mm -hmm. The baptism that is in effect at this point is John's baptism. Now, I want you to keep something in mind here. If you go back to the limited commission in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter into the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so in the beginning, the message was to go to the Jews. Even on the limited commission, he said, don't take it to the Gentiles, don't take it to the Samaritans. Mm -hmm. The purpose of John's baptism was for the Jews. Mm -hmm. And so in John chapter 3, 
we have um, Nicodemus being told he needs to be born of the water and the spirit. Mm -hmm. That's John's baptism. Mm -hmm. That would have been for Nicodemus because he's a Jew. You get to John chapter four, the Samaritan woman, she is not a Jew. Mm -hmm. And so John's baptism is not going to apply to her. Now, you mentioned a moment ago about John chapter three. Um, sometimes even members of the church discuss whether uh, that's John's baptism or the baptism of Christ. I think there's a principle laid down there that applied to both because mm -hmm. John's baptism was for the remission of sins for people prior to Acts chapter 2, but the same principle of being born of water and the Spirit applied after Acts chapter 2 mm -hmm. in Christ's baptism. Mm -hmm. So um, it's there's not a trick. This is not something that uh, we've fallen into or we're being inconsistent sure. about. It has to do with uh, the thief on the cross and Nicodemus and uh, the Samaritan woman are all in different situations mm -hmm. here. And I think sometimes people will say with limited commission, they didn't go, you were not to go to the Samaritan. Why did Jesus in John 4 go through Samaria? Well, I think number one, he wanted to meet that lady. Number two, it was expedient. He didn't want to take the Transjordanian uh, Trans pathway that the Jews did across the Jordan to keep away from the Samaritans. Mm -hmm. But also think about Matthew 15. <clears throat> where the Syrophoenician woman came. She was a, a woman of Matthew's gospel calls her a woman of Canaan. Mm -hmm. But the Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus. And here in uh, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24, he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right. So Jesus's mission was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the things being taught to them are gonna be different. And you actually don't see, even when the new covenant comes into effect in Acts 2, it's still to the Jews until what, Acts 8, Philip goes to uh, Samaria and then Acts 10 to Cornelius' household. Yep, so I right. think they're trying to conflate some of these things in this transition period from the law of Moses to the baptism of John, fulfilling, leading to Christ and the cross and the shedding of his blood that would inaugurate that new covenant that comes in in Acts chapter two. And, and they're trying to move these things back and forth and sort of ignore the Bible process and transition that it gives us. Yeah. And not a, a big deal, but I noticed he called the uh, Samaritan woman a prostitute. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's nothing in the text that indicates that she's a prostitute. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if there's a tradition. I went back and looked this up. I couldn't find any indication mm -hmm. that she's a prostitute. So I'm not sure where that came from. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Yeah. Next clip. I'm now, I got the Church of Christ hat on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm looking at you. And I'm like, dude, you think you got me on something? I'm about to wear you out. Uh-oh. Right? Yeah. I'd be like, Jeremiah, dude, you don't understand something. Listen to me. Why is someone baptized? What do they get baptized in? What does Romans 6 say? Mm. You're baptized into the death. It says, look, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How yeah. can we live any longer? Don't you know that all of us who are baptized, we're baptized into the death of Christ, right? Into his burial, into his resurrection, Right. In order that we might be saved. So, so, in other words, you, so in other words, you wouldn't answer the text. You, you would divert to no, another No, no, I one. wouldn't even divert. Yeah. I'm just, I'm explaining to you okay. why this woman wouldn't get baptized. Why would she be baptized into the death of Jesus when he's not dead yet? Oh, okay. If baptism is being baptized into the death of Christ, into the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ, why would this woman? But wouldn't that also be contradicting John 3 because... He's mentioning water baptism before his death, saying this is how you must be born again. And that's, it seems, it's now that's you're in the something. present tense. Right. But, you know, mm. yeah. See, like, th that's what they, they would, ah, that's what my oh, point is. Why yeah. do they, why are you telling me that Jesus doesn't mention baptism to the thief on the cross at the end of his right. life, but he does on the beginning mm. when he's not dead here either in chapter three? Yeah. Because that's not what it's about. I mean, I think we've already sort of covered this. Trey's making the argument why would this, why would the Samaritan woman, how could she be baptized in the death of Christ when Christ isn't dead yet? And yeah. we would agree. We sure. don't think that she would have. And she was a Samaritan. That's Jesus right. was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeah. So. I would sum it up very quickly. I would argue Nicodemus was a Jew. He was, uh, the baptism of John was mm -hmm. applicable to him. The mm -hmm. Samaritan woman was not a Jew. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the principle of Matthew 10 would be applicable. The thief on the cross, we don't know if he was baptized and he may not have been a Jew. That's a good point. Good point. Yeah. And again, here's, here's what I would say. It's not so much when you talk to someone in the Church of Christ getting into a deep Baptist baptism debate with them. Yeah. You know, you got to hit, dude, you were a wretched sinner. You, have, you were born yeah. in sin, and, and you know it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and you get them to see, like, kids are bad. Yeah. You know, you, you're a horrible person. God is a holy God, eternal God, and your righteous deeds. So mm. think about it. Is baptism a righteous deed or not? Is baptism a righteous deed? Yeah. Yeah, it's a righteous deed. 
But guess what it is? It's a filthy rag to God. Yeah. There is nothing. And when you say they would agree with you, there's nothing you can do for your salvation. But you ask them, do you really believe that? Do you believe that there's nothing you can do? Mm-hmm. So that means even your baptism. No, there's nothing. It's faith alone in Christ alone. And then you can show them all through Acts that it's not baptism in Acts. And you, you know, mm-hmm. I like to stay in Acts because in fundamentalist groups, which the Church of Christ is a fundamentalist group, they like to stay in Acts. Yeah. Because there's a lot of baptism. Like Pentecostals love to stay in Acts because there's like a lot of tongue stuff, you know? Yeah. And so that's where they want to stay and camp out there. And so I was like, look, let's just stay in Acts. Let's stay in Acts. We ain't got to go, like, because if we go anywhere else, you're going to drown in Scripture, right? So mm-hmm. let's just stay in Acts, see what it says. But you've got to understand where they're coming from. They're coming from, like, you look at chapter 4 from an orthodox Christian view. You have to look at it from an unorthodox Yeah. that... That's not even New Testament. Mm-hmm. So, so you, you think that's New Testament. That's not even New Testament. Yeah. That's, that's why it doesn't apply. So in this um, clip, Trey talks about how basically children are born wicked, sinful, vipers and diapers, as some of them say. Um, we've already talked about that. Um, he, says, uh, he says, we agree there's nothing you have to do. Do you agree there's nothing you have to do? Uh, absolutely not. You know, we've covered a lot of verses on this, but you know, Saul's told in Acts 9, go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Mm -hmm. Uh, The judgment scene, Matthew 7, 21, those who are saved are those who do the will of the Father. Uh, Hebrews 5, 9, that uh, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. Uh, Acts 10, 35, he that works righteousness is accepted of him. We could just go on and on with uh, the verses, but Uh, And again, that's not the idea that you earn your salvation, but God will save us when we accept His grace through obedience. And you know, there's so many passages, John 6, 28, 29, they said to Jesus, what are the works that we must do? And Jesus said, this is the work of God, believe. So Jesus didn't say, hey, what must we do? Nothing, don't do anything. You said Acts 9, 6. In Acts 10, 6, the very next chapter, Cornelius, he will tell you what you must do. Didn't say, there's nothing you must do. It's something that, it sounds like Colossians 2, it talks about false humility, uh-huh. right? There are some doctrines that sound really humble, mm-hmm. but are actually in opposition to what God, so that they yeah. seem humble, but they're actually really arrogant. Yeah. So when God says there's something you must do repeatedly, and you say there's nothing you must do, mm-hmm. you sound humble. You sound like, well, look, there's nothing you can do. Jesus did it all. Well, of course Jesus did all of his part, mm-hmm. but the fact is the Bible does say there's something you have to do. Right. So really the epitome of humility is saying, God said it, I'm going to do it. And I still realize that I'm unworthy. That's right. The the epitome of arrogance is saying God said you have to do something, and you say something different. Yeah. He once again re, re, restates that we take the unorthodox view that the Gospels are Old Testament. We don't teach that. Uh, and in fact, like I said earlier, what they're teaching is unorthodox. It's what the, the Gnostics actually taught. So, next clip. So let's get let's get to Acts two thirty eight then. Yeah. Uh, specifically, since that is New Testament, right? And it's going to New op- Testament uh, apply to us. Can you read it and then? kind of give the the idea behind it because i got a question uh with regards in t- to acts 238 maybe i'm thinking incorrectly uh but i would love to hear you just uh, go through it real quick acts 238 peter said i can quote it to you but peter said to them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the holy spirit for this promise is for you and for your children For all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And I want to say this real quick, because we started off by saying I was mentored and discipled by Phil Robertson. Yeah. You know, when I came, became reformed and studying historical Christianity and and, and seeing this stuff. And then, you know, before I even went to seminary or any of that, um, you know, I got, you know, none of my leaders would talk to me about this and like study with me, you know, because I'd be like, I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm just like, look, what does this mean? Right? Right. What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And they're just like, no, 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 no. It doesn't mean that. Whatever it means, it doesn't mean that. You know. And so I was just not satisfied with the answer of it doesn't mean that. But I want to say that like of all of my leaders where I came from, the only one who literally sat down and studied with me was Phil. And that's what I really love and appreciate and respect yeah. about him. And, and this verse reminds me when we were studying, you know, one of the other guys who was there asked me, what does Acts 2.38 say? And I said, well, it says, repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What does verse 39 say? And he's like, ah, you know? I'm like, well, let's read it. And so Phil reads it and he says, it's, he gets his Bible out 
and he, he reads it. It's, it's this promise is for you, your children, all who are far off, all whom the Lord God calls to Himself. And then when he read that part, it's for all whom the Lord God calls. He's like, all right, I'm listening now. And so we had a really good Bible study. I appreciate the time that he gave me to, to listen. You know, he's the only one. And so, I mean, I just want to say that that meant a lot to me. Yeah. Well, even, even too, when you look and we, we gave an example, too, we're kind of we're going into, uh, you know, kind of like playing devil's advocate, going back and forth, talking, mm-hmm. putting the Church of Christ hat on yeah. and, um, you know, talking about that. So we, we use the example between John three and John four. And, and, I, and obviously that was an example to show that it's important as Christians to read the entirety of the Bible in context. And the more you become familiar with the original, you'll be able to give answers to people, not just to say, ha, I'm right, you're wrong, but to ask constructive questions to get them to think. Because mm-hmm. one of them, I think the, the real sweet spot is, there's two things. Is one, you want when you can get them in a place where you can just say something that's outside the realm of what their proof texts are, and all of a sudden you get them to think, that that's really where the, where the, where the real juice is in regards to uh, evangelism to uh, to occultists and getting them to think, That's but it. also I think that um, you know presuppositionally we don't have to necessarily convince them that they are sinners under the burden of sin. They know that they are according mm-hmm. to what Scripture already says about right. them. So there's that. But jumping into Acts two thirty eight, and you're familiar with this passage too. I believe it's in Acts chapter ten mm-hmm. where it. So we're going to go ahead and stop before we get into Acts chapter 10 and talk about Acts 2.38. So in this section, Andrew asks Trey about Acts 2.38 and basically what the text says and what it means. Uh, Trey doesn't, he doesn't touch it. Um, He reads Acts 2.38.39 and makes a big point out of verse 39, who God will call into himself. Um, But the question is not, does God call, but how does God call? Mm -hmm. How would you say God calls somebody? 2 Thessalonians 2.14 says that we are called by the gospel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I think of John chapter 12 and verse uh, 42, where basically it says, uh, nevertheless, that's not the right verse, uh, where it basically says when Jesus, uh, when he's lifted up, mm-hmm. he will draw all men to him. Right. So people say, well, how does God draw or how does God call? He calls with the gospel. That's right. How does God draw men to himself? Through the story of Jesus. That's right. When you hear Romans 5, 8, and 9, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, Mm -hmm. that should draw you to someone that would do that for you. That's right. Yeah. In fact, the word means invite, summon. Yeah. It does not mean drag. That's right. And that's the Calvinistic idea that he's implying, that God drags people to him against their will, and they had nothing to do with it. And it's ironic, if that's what it meant in Acts 2.39, that God drags these people, Mm -hmm. and they have nothing to do with it, then Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, Peter doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. Because Peter says, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved, or some versions say, save yourselves from mm-hmm. this untoward generation. When I uh, discussed this with, uh, with Trey in the debate, um, uh, I asked him about that, and he said, well, you don't think you can save yourself, do you? And I said, well, it depends on what you mean, because in some sense, Peter said, there's something you have to do yeah. to be saved. You have to do something to save yourself, yeah. which just flies in the face of the Calvinistic idea. You know, in the idea of Acts two thirty nine and God calling them, on that I on, in, in on that occasion, mm-hmm. Peter preached. Their hearts were pricked by the message, and then some of them gladly received the word. Verse forty one. Mm-hmm. The word for receive there means accepted or welcomed. Mm-hmm. God didn't drag them into this. Mm-hmm. He didn't force them into this. Mm-hmm. They heard the message. And they welcomed the message. They accepted the message. And so God called by the gospel, and they accepted it and welcomed it. That's right. I said John 12, 42, and John 12, 32. Jesus said, uh, and if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. Yeah. All men is added, I think, peoples in some translations, italics, which means yeah. it's not in the Greek. But uh-huh. I will draw all to myself, all yeah. people mm-hmm. to myself. Okay. Um, let's go to the next clip here. This is a counterpoint where it said where there's uh, the gospel is being preached, and just for the sake of to paraphrase that, there's a there's a, a group that experiences conversion, and it says, "Shall we not bring these people to the baptism of water to, to be baptized, mm-hmm. as they have received the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. just as we have?" So in that context, what you see is that these people have already received the Holy Spirit prior to the waters of baptism. Yeah. So if, if we're going to, you know, put on your Church of Christ hat. On that one? Well, it's saying, well, hold on a second. Well, you're, you're giving this as a 
this is the method. A method is being taught for baptism in Acts 2.38, mm -hmm. but we're seeing here these people are being told have already received the Holy Spirit and they haven't been baptized. H how do you account for the two? Yeah. So in this clip, they leave Acts 2.38 without Trey actually ever answering the Andrew's question. Now, if you want to see how Trey approaches Acts 2.38, you can go to our, we had three debates. I think the second debate is when Trey and I actually discuss Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. But he leaves that and they, they jump to Acts chapter 10 about Cornelius' household. Jeremiah sort of summarizes what he thinks the story is, mm -hmm. but I think he makes some statements that are assumptions and not what the text actually says. He says the gospel was preached and this group experiences conversion. Mm -hmm. And then he says, after they experience conversion, the text says, shall we not bring these people to water to be baptized as they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Mm -hmm. So what you see, he says, is the people have already been converted, mm -hmm. received the Holy Spirit, prior to baptism. Mm -hmm. And then he says, you know, as if Acts 2.38 is the way it always happens, how do you account for the two? So how would you start to begin to explain someone, uh, explain Acts chapter 10 and 11 to somebody, the, the conversion of Cornelius? Uh, the first thing that I would say uh, addressing his statement, uh, he states that uh, conversion has occurred before mm -hmm. baptism. Mm -hmm. He's asserted that. The, the right. Bible doesn't say that they were converted That's right. prior to baptism. And so you've got to look at what the text says, not what he sticks in there or mm -hmm. else he's going to slide that by you. Um, what we have to keep in mind is there is a tremendous prejudice that existed between Jews and Gentiles mm -hmm. in the first century. Mm -hmm. And when the Lord began, when he's going to bring Gentiles into the church, there's going to be a tremendous pushback by the Gentile Christian or by the uh, Jewish Christians. Yeah. And so what we have in Acts chapter 10 is the Lord performing a miracle. The Holy Spirit falls upon them in a miraculous way. They begin mm -hmm. to speak in tongues mm -hmm. so that when the Jews see this, Peter and those who are with him see this, they're taken back. Mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're quite stunned. They see a miracle being performed by the Gentiles mm -hmm. and they say, wow, this is amazing. And what they identify that with is Acts chapter 2. Mm -hmm. They say this is what happened to the Jews in Acts mm -hmm. chapter 2, specifically the apostles. And so it's also interesting because when you get to Acts chapter 10, between Acts 2 and Acts 10, there's been years, mm -hmm. at least 10. Some yeah. people think more than that. Yeah. And in all that time, this doesn't happen every time a person is converted. Mm -hmm. It's not the case that every time a person is baptized, the Holy Spirit fell on them and they mm -hmm. began to speak in tongues, mm -hmm. or this would have been normal. Yeah. Peter and his company wouldn't have said, oh, this is just normal business. What they said is, wow, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And they don't say like it always does. That's right. They said the Holy Spirit fell on them like it did on us back at the beginning in Acts chapter 2. So the Lord is taking them back to the day that the church began mm -hmm. for the Jews, mm -hmm. and he is showing his acceptance of the Gentiles. So when they see this, they're stunned by this. And then they, they recognize God is accepting the Gentiles. That's why they then opened the door to conversion and said, can any forbid water that they should not be baptized who have received the Spirit like as we. And you know, it's funny, like you said, there's a phrase in Acts 10 and Acts 11, and Acts 11 gives you more information. In Acts 10, it says they received the Spirit just like we have. Mm -hmm. But if you look at Acts 11, I think it's verse 16, I'll have it in my notes in a second. It said they received the Spirit just like us in the beginning. That's right. And it's interesting, you said that, you know, there, it's true, there's this huge divide between Jew and Gentile, right? Uh -huh. And for the Jews to allow the Gentiles to come into what they see as their covenant, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a big deal. Yeah. And it's not only the miracle of Cornelius and his family speaking in tongues. In Acts 10, 16, God gives Peter a vision mm -hmm. three times. He That's gives him right. a vision of unclean animals, and God says, hey, these are clean now, you can eat them. In Acts 10, 28, Peter finally understands what the vision means. Mm -hmm. Hey, Gentiles are no longer unclean. Then Acts 10, 33, Cornelius explains he also had a vision, and an angel talked to him. So you've got... The vision of Peter, you could count that as one or three visions, one or three miracles, Cornelius's, and now in Acts 10.35, Peter says, I now understand God doesn't show partiality. He's saying right. Jew and Gentile are now in the same covenant. And then while he's speaking, that other miracle, the gift of tongues comes. And then it says, verse 10.45, you said, those of the circumcision, the Jews, were astonished. Why were they astonished? Yeah. If this is how it happened every time, right. they should have said, oh, wow, this is how it's happened every time for the last 10 years. But no, what do they point back to? Acts 10, 46, 
Why were they astonished? They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. If this is how it always happened, it should have been common. They shouldn't have been astonished. That's right. God has, is doing something in Acts 10. They haven't seen since Acts 2, likely 10 or more years prior. And so they haven't seen this in 10 years. It's a miracle. And in Acts 11, Peter goes back to Jerusalem, and the Jews are angry that he went to Gentiles. What are you doing? Yeah. And he says, let me tell you about this. He says, God called the Gentiles clean now. And then in Acts yeah. eleven fifteen, 15, and I, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us in the beginning. He's calling it back to Acts chapter 2. Yep. And so basically what they have is they're saying that they have this idea that as soon as they receive the Holy Spirit, that's some sort of Get show, show, uh, showing of their salvation. That's not what it is. It's miraculous. That's right. It's a sign. That's right. And so once they see the Gentiles have this sign, now they say, whoa, they're in the covenant now. Who can forbid water? That's right. And then they're baptized. And so I think a lot of times people, they, they have a lot of misunderstandings about certain concepts. And so they get to Acts 10 and 11, and they don't take the time to actually go through this verse by verse and think, uh, think critically. Why are they so astonished? Yeah. There's only one reason. That's This is not a common occurrence. Yeah, that's you know? right. You know, I think something that's worth mentioning here is it is a common belief in the denominational world that the fact that Cornelius received the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. they take that as proof that he was saved. Mm -hmm. And that is simply not the case. Mm -hmm. What happened here, he received the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way. That's right. He spoke in tongues. This is not an indication of his salvation. Mm -hmm. This was a miraculous sign to show God's acceptance of the Gentiles. You know, the Holy Spirit sometimes came on people who clearly were not saved. Mm -hmm. In John chapter 11 and verse 49, you've got Caiaphas. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, and one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not for the whole, whole, for the whole nation. Now listen, the Bible says, now he did not say this of his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied mm -hmm. that Jesus would die for the nation. Mm -hmm. Now the point of that is when a person was prophesying, they were speaking by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That is the Holy Spirit gave them this message and so the Holy Spirit is speaking through one of the people who is ready to condemn Christianity. Mm -hmm. The fact that he had the Holy Spirit here was not proof of his salvation. Um, I think of Balaam's donkey in yeah. the Old Testament. Yeah, that's, Numbers 22, 21 through 39, Balaam's donkey spoke miraculously. That's right. Just because he spoke miraculously doesn't mean that he was, you know, Balaam's donkey. I don't think I'm going to see him in paradise or heaven, right? That's right. And then you yeah. also have this interesting passage in 1 Samuel 16, 14 with Saul. Uh -huh. It says yeah. the spirit departed from him. That's 1 right. Samuel 16, uh -huh. three chapters later, 1 Samuel 19, 23, Saul prophesied. Yeah. So a lot of times this miraculous prophesying is to prove a point or send a message. It does not necessarily mean the person is saved. You know, one other thing that I think is worth uh, noticing, in Acts chapter 10, you've got the Holy Spirit coming upon a Cornelius' household. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 11, Peter goes back to Jerusalem mm -hmm. and he's telling the apostles and the brethren about this and they're really upset that he's gone into the Gentiles and he's eaten with them and you know he's baptized them. Yeah. And Peter begins to rehearse the story of what happened. And he says in Acts 11, 15, mm -hmm. and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Mm -hmm. How long had Peter been speaking? Mm -hmm. He said, as I began speak. to speak, Peter has just started talking. Mm -hmm. They haven't even had enough time to hear the message that would convert them. Mm -hmm. How is a person to be saved? He's, he's just started mm -hmm. and yet the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And so they don't even know the gospel yet. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what they need to do. And yet the Holy Spirit has fallen upon them and that was the proof they are worthy of the gospel and acceptance as Christians. And I think the verse before that sort of helps solidify that because he says, send men to Joppa, an angel says, to, and, and call for Simon, who's Peter. He will tell you words by which you and your household. So Peter says, right. I was brought to bring words. And That's as right. soon as I began to speak, I was That's brought right. to spring it to bring a sermon. And as just as I started, didn't even get the message out. And then listen to this, verse 16. Then I re he says, as I began to speak, 15, the Holy Spirit fell upon us as uh, fell upon them, as upon us in the beginning, Acts 2. And then, verse 16, then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 1-8. That's right. That was a promise to the apostles that was fulfilled in Acts 2. And then listen to this. 
Verse 17, if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who, what, what gift is this? The gift is the gift of Acts 2 yeah. and the gift of Acts 10, this miraculous the gift miraculous of the Holy Spirit. Gift. Yeah. And then once they saw, oh, they're in the co- they can they are able to enter the covenant now. Gentiles can. Yeah. Then they share with them the great commission: to yeah. believe and be baptized. Yeah. Who can forbid water? And That's so right. they were baptized. So. Yep. All right. Next clip. Um. So here's what the, a good Church of Christ would say. But I, before I even put my Church of Christ hat on, this is in uh, Acts 10, and if you look at verse 43, it says, "To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him." receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. And I had uh, uh, one of my old friends tell me that that's just shorthand for baptism. I'm like, man, wait. It literally says that whoever believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins. And just you can just say that's shorthand for what you believe it. Like, mm-hmm. it, that's crazy. You know, but it, it, that's, what, that's what happens. So what I would say as a church, if I'm putting my church Christ hat on right yeah. here with, with chapter 10... And you mentioned the, the key verse that should be read as a Church of Christ person, but here would be the explanation. If you were a Church of Christ person explaining this, I'll read the text and then explain it to you in a Church of Christ way. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and exhorting God, and Peter declared, Can can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit? They stop there. I would stop there as a church of Christ, right? And I wouldn't do it on a conscious level. It's just the way I was trained. Mm-hmm. So I would just stop there. Yeah. Right? Because my focus is what? Baptism. That's my focus. And so I would say, okay, here's what you need to understand. These are the first Gentiles converted, correct? Yeah. Okay. You correct? These are the first Gentiles converted? Okay. So let me ask you a question. It says the Holy Spirit fell on them, okay? So, Andrew, what's better for a baby, milk on them or in them? In them. In them. Mm. What would you say? Would, it, would milk be better poured on a baby or in a baby? Um, would I would say? be very concerned to see, I mean, we're here at Fight Left Feast, and there's a lot of people. Uh, just pouring milk on that, their babies? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of people, a lot of kids. <laughs> lot of Some kids people here. carry around babies. And pouring, uh, I, have, on I have not seen anyone pour milk on their baby yet. Right. So you would uh, say it's better have, to I would be in be, them. I'll be concerned. I'm like, is everything okay? Right. You need, so as you, you can see here, yeah. Jeremiah, <laughs> yeah. the spirit is not in them. It's on them. It oh. just fell on them to show Peter and the other apostles that they can be baptized and actually receive the Holy Spirit. Mm. And now look, now you're someone that doesn't know the Bible, right? Oh. You are, you don't know anything about the Bible. And so you're like hearing this, you're like, oh my gosh, that makes sense. Milk in a baby, on a baby. Yeah. Holy Spirit was on them, not in them. It was just to show them that the Gentiles could be saved. Oh, yeah, I get it. And you flip to something else, right? But yeah. let's just pause. Read that verse again, verse 47 of chapter 10. Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Mm. Mm-hmm. So, see, they talked to me, and I would have to say, well, listen, are you saying that the apostles and Peter did not have the Spirit in them? It was just on them? Because they received the Holy Spirit the just as way. they did. Yeah. And so then I want to... So in this section, Trey basically goes to Acts 10.43 and makes the statement that someone t- told him that belief is shorthand for baptism. We've referenced a term earlier, synecdoche. The Bible uses that frequently, and basically, I mean, it's a figure of speech. Mm-hmm. In one of our debates, I've heard Trey try to deny this. Mm-hmm. So I said, Trey, do you hold to, it's fancy word, grammatical historical, which means you look at the words and what they meant at the time. It's fancy word for, and that basically means you're allowed to use figures of speech. He said, oh, yes, I hold to that. I said, so you allow figures of speech? Well, yes. And I said, so you allow synecdoche? And at first he agreed. And I said, you know, are we saved by the cross? Are we saved by the wood? He said, well, no. We're, the cross stands for what happened to Jesus, his life. His, so he agreed to it. Then a couple minutes later, he tried to basically withdraw from it once he'd committed. But the Bible writers frequently use that, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I think something that you would bring up is Acts 10.43 says, believes receives remission of sins. If that's the only verse you had about remission of sins, yeah. I'd say, hey, you just sure. believe and you get it. Listen to this. Acts eleven eighteen. repentance unto life. Yeah. Repentance leading to life. Well, what about belief? Well, it's mentioned other places. Yeah. Uh, I would think about Acts five thirty one. repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Belief's not mentioned in there, right? Luke 24, 47, repentance and remission of sins. Yeah. See, you have all these passages that give you different aspects and you have to put them all together. So what he's trying to do is just take one verse 
and say, this says when you believe you receive remission of sins, and let's ignore all the other verses. And I, I want to point out, they keep referencing something called proof texting. Yeah. And for some mm. who's, someone who's listening, and you may not be familiar with that, the idea is you want to prove a doctrine, and so you go and get one verse, and you pull it out of context, and you read that verse and say, see, it proves my point. That is exactly what Trey is doing in this, in this passage. He is saying, this verse says that you have to believe. He ignores all of the other verses that state uh, things that must mm -hmm. be done with regard to salvation, hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and to say this verse says believe, and therefore it's faith only. The second thing that mm -hmm. is done is every time a verse is stated that says a person has to believe, they treat that as belief only. Mm -hmm. And the Bible never says that. I think about if, if I wanted to do what he's doing, if I wanted to truly proof text, here's what I would do. I wouldn't do this. It'd be dishonest. But I could say 1 Peter 3.21 says this, There is also the like figure or antitype which now saves us. What saves us? Baptism. And then I could say, not the removal of the filth of flesh, but the answer or appeal of, God, of a good conscience towards God. And I could say, the Bible says baptism saves us. That's why I baptize babies. And you say, well, other verses say belief. No, no, no. This verse says if baptism right. saves you. That's what he's doing with belief. Yep. And in fact, he's what doing he the exact would, same thing. He would go so far as to say, now, if you don't believe that, you don't believe God. That's right. You don't believe the Bible. That's right. That's exact. That's what proof texting is. Yeah. Now, there's a difference. I heard someone say this, and it really was a good comment. There's a difference between using some of God's word, S O M E, mm -hmm. and the sum, S U M, of God's word. Yeah. If you want to be a true Bible student and you want to please God, you need to use the sum. Well, Psalm 119, 160. There's the Old Testament. The sum of thy word is truth. Right. You can't use parts of it. You have to use all of it. Right. The other thing he focused on is he once again brought up this idea of, you know, in Acts chapter 10, where it says, Acts 10, 47, those who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Mm -hmm. But don't forget Acts 11, 15 and 16, where it says, receive the Spirit, how? Just as we have when? In the beginning. That's right. So it's Acts 10, 47 is is more information is given in Acts 11. He's not saying this is how everyone happened or else why would they be uh, astonished? Yeah. He also made a comment about being trained to focus uh, on baptism. Have you, I mean, how, how, has your, how have you been trained to examine the Bible and to teach things? Um, I have always been trained to look at the context, yeah. to look at the entirety, the opposite of proof texting. Yeah. And so I've been trained that I've got to, in fact, when I study with someone, we will go through all these different passages that state, okay, a person needs to do mm -hmm. this to be saved. Mm -hmm. They need to do this to be mm -hmm. saved. And we'll start a list mm -hmm. and we'll write these things down. I won't pick just one verse and mm -hmm. say, okay, this one says baptism. Mm -hmm. We're going to ignore all the others. We'll look at all of them and mm -hmm. say, now all of these things are required for a person to do. And I think, in fact, the, the opposite of proof texting is going through chapter by chapter. We've covered almost almost all of chapter 10 and 11, mm -hmm. even if some of it's in summary, just in this little discussion. That's what you ought to do. Mm -hmm. You should test what we're saying, test what they're saying, and the best way to do is to read the New Testament for yourself. Yep. Yep. All right, let's go to the next clip. Turn real quick to 15, chapter 15. He retells the story. Luke records it again. He says, look, after there had been much debate, Paul's right there, after there had been much debate. So that's not wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to stand up for the truth, contend for the faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of, God, of, of the gospel and believe, not be baptized, but and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Mm. So he retells the story and again says they received the Holy Spirit just like we did when we had faith. So here he jumps to Acts 15, which is a, basically a recounting at the Jerusalem Council. Mm -hmm. And he reads Acts 15, 6 through 9. He basically makes three points. Uh, the first point he says, he says, um, he says, it says, hear the word of the gospel and believe. It doesn't say be baptized. Now, how would you respond? Well, this verse doesn't say be baptized here. This is the argument that just gets made over and over, mm -hmm. and um, it gets kind of wearisome because anytime you see the um, a statement that says you have to believe, they say it only says that. It, it, it ignores 
all of these other things. Mm -hmm. Baptism is not stated. And again, when they see believe, they assume that it means believe only. Mm -hmm. That's an assumption yeah. that it's not there in the text. And again, all of the other things um, are still required, mm -hmm. but he begins with the fact that they need to believe. Mm -hmm. We need to get it in our heads that when he says we need to believe, he is talking about obedient faith. That's right. And, you know, I think about the fact that, you know what else he doesn't say in the, this section of Acts 15, 6 through 9? He doesn't say repent. That's true. So would someone be able to say, well, Cornelius, they didn't have to repent. Acts eleven eighteen back in the actual account. Yeah. When they heard these things, Acts eleven eighteen they became silent. They glorified God saying, this is the people hearing about the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. Right. So in that account, the Bible says that they had not only to believe, but they also had to what? Repent. Yeah, yeah. So baptism's not here, but it's other places. Now, yeah. funny, if anyone was going to watch the debates, Trey doesn't think you have to believe or confess anyway. Yeah. He initially said you have to believe and confess to be saved yeah. and repent. Then by the end of the debates, he said, well, you're saved before you repent. You're saved yeah. before you confess. You know, uh, sometimes when you talk to Reformed people, they will, uh, of the Reformed theology, they will say that you have to call upon the name of the Lord yeah. in order to be saved. And yet, that's not uh, stated here. Yeah. He simply says, believe. So yeah. they will say you have to believe and call. Yeah. Well, you could make the argument they're making here about faith. You could add the word call yeah. every single time, which incidentally, the way we call upon God is through obedience, and that is through baptism. And it's funny, in our first debate, we talked about Acts twenty two sixteen, and he said that sins are forgiven when you call in the name of the Lord. Right. And so then by the, by the second debate, we went to Romans 10, and I showed him how belief comes before calling. Well, he right. says you're saved as soon as you believe. That's right. So first debate, he said, sins are forgiven when you call on God's name. That's right. By the second debate, he changed his position completely yeah. and basically said, oh, no, 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 you're saved before you call on the name of the Lord. That's because you'd caught him. You, you yeah. showed his inconsistency, yeah. and he, he had no choice but to back up. And in that. fact, in the debate, whenever I made that point, he kind of got flustered, and he said, that's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah. So I mean, he didn't know how to answer it. And yeah. I think that's, I'm just saying, just speaking freely, it's because when you have a false doctrine, yeah. the Bible, God inspired the Bible in a way that's right. that picks false doctrine apart if you actually know what the Bible says about certain things. That's right. I, I'm glad that y'all have done these debates because... Um, it has nothing to do with arrogance, but it has to do with the fact that the truth will always prevail. Mm -hmm. And I think when people look at the doctrine that is being put out mm -hmm. and compare it to the truth, the truth always tears it down. It can mm -hmm. be misrepresented, mm -hmm. but when a person has an opportunity, when you go through the conversion of Saul yeah. and you go through Acts 9 and 22 and 26 yeah. and you look at it piece by piece, it just makes perfect sense. And you'll see that the arguments that uh, Trey makes fall apart. Absolutely. The other point he made, again, he sort of hammered on this, is he says, Acts 15.8 says, God gave them the Holy Spirit just, uh, let me read Acts 15.8. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. Uh, my version, the New King James here says, just as to us, he did as in italics. But he's saying, hey, we got the Spirit just like they did. And if you remember what we said before, that Acts 11 and verse, uh, Acts chapter 11, 15 and 16 gives more information. The Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. And then verse 16 and 17 reference the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So this is not talking about some indwelling that shows they were saved. This is talking about the miraculous baptism of the Holy Spirit that happened in Acts chapter 2, happened in Acts chapter 10. Yeah. So that's what that passage is talking about. And you know, just as a side note here, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, mm -hmm. and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is, you shall receive the gift. Mm -hmm. What gift? The gift that the apostles had just received. Mm -hmm. I believe he's talking about the miraculous. Mm -hmm. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all who are far off. Mm -hmm. Who are those who are far off? If you look at Acts 2.17, the promise was that God was going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. Mm -hmm. That's a reference to the Jews and the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And then he says, you Jews are going to receive this gift, but the promise is unto you and your children, the Jews, and to all who are afar off. Mm -hmm. I'm asserting that that is a reference to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. When you get to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 17... That's where I was flipping to. Okay, You're already there. <laughs> you can see that... The, the uh, Gentiles are referred to those who are 
afar off. Mm -hmm. Also in Acts, uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter two and verse thirteen, mm -hmm. once again he makes this statement. And so mm -hmm. we see the Gentiles are those who are afar off. Mm -hmm. The promise of the Holy Spirit was going to fall on all flesh, Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. It is for you and your children, Jews, those who are far off, mm -hmm. Gentiles. And then what do you see as the gospel unfolds? Acts chapter 2, yeah. the miraculous gifts go to the Jews. Acts chapter 10, the miraculous gifts are given to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And that is the fulfillment of Acts 2.39. And you talk about that promise. You know, the receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise is to you, your children, and those afar off. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes what's the word? The promise, there's different promises in the Bible. Right. But contextually, you look yeah. at the context, uh, I have my Bible from Acts 2.39, promise circled and a line drawn to the previous occurrence that's the closest to that, and that's Acts 2.33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, Jesus, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, the promise of the Holy Spirit, and look at how he describes it, which you now see and hear. Right. What were they seeing and hearing in Acts 2? That's right. Miraculous this, gifts. The Holy Spirit, yes. And it, they were astonished in Acts 2. Yeah. Same thing happens in Acts 10 and what happens? They're astonished. And the only thing they can point back to in Acts 10, what do we compare this to? That's right. The beginning, yeah. Acts chapter 2. Yep. Okay. Thank you for joining us for part five. We hope that you will join us again for part number six. And hopefully at that time, we will wrap up this study. Thank you for watching Answering the Air, where we looked at the cultish episode examining the Church of Christ. If you'd like to watch my debates with Trey, you can watch them right here on the screen. And if you'd like to watch more content, follow the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Have a great day.